In today's conversation on this Father's Day, as we look at Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to unpack two virtues that wise dads model. That's what our conversation is today. Two virtues that wise dads model. You know, as we look at Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to read some advice that King Solomon gives his son. And so I've approached this from the perspective of if this is advice that King Solomon is giving to his son, then it's probably advice that King Solomon wants to practice in his own life as well. And so the verse, the, the, these virtues that we're going to unpack today are uh, found in the first three verses, believe it or not, of this chapter. And so that's where we're going to focus our conversation. So if you have Proverbs chapter 7, go to verse 1. See if you can identify or pinpoint what these virtues might be that Solomon wants, dad, or says, suggests that wise dads model. So here we go, verse one. Follow my advice, my son, always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eye. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder, write them deep within your heart. So church, here in verse one, King Solomon tells his son to follow his advice. That's what he says, right? Follow my advice. Now think about this. What perspective is required to follow another person's advice? You know, what attitude must one have in order to heed the input from another? You know, I propose that a person who exemplifies a willingness to learn from another, a person who's willing to submit themselves to another person's input, so to speak, and acquiesce to another person's counsel, I think that the virtue that they are embodying is the virtue of humility. And so I'm proposing that the first virtue that a wise dad will model for his kids is the virtue of humility. A wise dad is humble. He's humble. You know, throughout the pages of the Bible, if you and I were to study the great, really spiritual giants of the Christian faith, one of the virtues that you would see and I would recognize showcased in their lives is the virtue of humility. Most of the spiritual giants that we read about in, in Scripture really modeled that particular or emulated that particular quality. You know, the Apostle Paul was one such leader. In the book of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he's writing to the church, the Christians living in the region of, of Corinth. He says this, he says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. You know, like most great leaders, and you think about just the, the history of athletes, for example, if you have a favorite athlete or a leader, a lot of leaders will say, follow me, right? Follow my example. I can remember growing up as a kid, uh, I lived in uh, my high school, college years were in Minnesota, and, uh, and we always came down to the kind of the division playoff between the Chicago Bears and the Minnesota Vikings. And at that time, when I was in high school, uh, Walter Payton was kind of the guy. He would, he would actually, he would uh, work out uh, on this, we had this local uh, ski kind of mountain, and he would come and he would run, you know, up and down this mountain during the summer, to, in the off season to get ready for football. But Walter Payton, and had this famous saying when it came to the play, playoffs, climb on my back, right? And a lot of athletes will say that. Well, that's what Paul is saying here. Follow my example. I'll show you the way, which I really propose. That, that's it. As dads, that's what we want really to emulate for our own kids, right? Kids, walk in my footsteps. Follow my example. But then Paul was quick to add here in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, follow me because I'm following who? I'm following Jesus, right? You know, men, Paul, Paul was strong. Paul had his ideas and convictions about the way things should be like many of you. But Paul was not too proud to tell the people that he was leading that he had his eyes on, on Jesus, right? Paul was getting his marching orders from Jesus. And so what Paul was illustrating for us here, I think, is Paul recognized that he didn't have all, all the answers, right? 
Paul understood that he still had much to learn, which is why he kept his eyes on Jesus, which is what really what you guys are all emulating just by being here today. You're, 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 you're coming into this auditorium where you're watching online with this attitude of like, I want to learn something, right? I want to get better. I want to improve. Why? Because the Bible is a resource for daily living. You know, when we study the life of Jesus, one of the things that I love about Jesus is how he interacted with his team, how he interacted kind of with his, his posse of, of disciples. You know, in many ways, um, I, I suggest that Jesus' relationship with his boys, his crew, really sets the example or could be likened to the role of a dad with his son or daughter. You know, when you read in the Gospel of John chapter 6, for example, and we're going to look there, we can read a story where Jesus is out preaching. The Bible tells us that a bunch of people are coming. They're starting to listen to, to Jesus, what Jesus has to say. And then Jesus, uh, as, he's, as he's apparently dinner time rolls around, and, and so being a compassionate leader that he is, Jesus approaches his 12 disciples with the suggestion that they feed the people. Do you remember that story? If you have John chapter 6, turn there real quick. John chapter 6. And skip down to verse, verse 5. John 6 verse 5, this is what we read. John 6 verse 5. So Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Now, don't miss that. He was testing Philip, because he, but he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. But then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000, which means if they were married, then now you have a crowd of 10,000. And if you have a kid or two, then you got maybe up to 15,000. So we have a big group of people. Verse 11, then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, distributed them to the people. And afterward, he did the same with the fish and they all ate as much as they wanted. They all ate as much as they wanted. You know, here in the Gospel of John, we can read how Jesus does this amazing miracle, right? By multiplying five loaves and two fish to feed this, <clears throat> at least an audience of 5,000 that we're told here, 5,000 men. But what I love most about the story is how Jesus illustrates for us the importance of involving others in the problem solving. Remember that verse I, I highlighted as we were reading? We're told that Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do, Right? He sees this problem. He already has in mind sort of he, an idea of how he's going to remedy this food shortage problem. And yet, what does he do? He solicits the input from his disciples, doesn't he? Which, by the way, is an excellent leadership and parenting principle. Dads, you know, don't you, that you don't have to have all the answers? Right? You, you do know, don't you, that you don't have to be the guy that solves every problem that your family faces? You know, think about this. Dads, when you interact with your son and, or daughter, do you consider that what they have to say is valuable? Or do you somehow think that you know everything and that your ideas and your solutions are always best? No, no, no jabbing, okay? I can remember an experience I had when I was a sophomore in high school. I don't know if I've ever told you this story or not. <clears throat> but my dad, uh, there was a little bit of drama taking place in our house. And my dad said to me, he said, Mike, let's go for a drive. Let's go for a drive. We climbed into my dad's, into my dad's uh, work van. It was this classic 1969 Scooby-Doo uh, Ford Econoline. I don't know if you can envision that. And, and during our drive around the neighborhood, the neighborhood, my dad started to solicit my input to help him troubleshoot a problem that he was trying to work out with my mom. So basically, my dad was trying to ask for marital advice from me. He was giving me a little advice, and he was, he was soliciting it from me. 
And what my dad was modeling for me, I didn't really realize it until later, but as I was younger, what my dad was modeling for me was humility. You know, my dad illustrated for me how he was teachable, that he didn't have all the answers, right? And indirectly, what my dad was modeling for me was the value of getting input from others, just as Jesus did from his disciples. You know, we've talked about this in the past, that there are at least two kinds of mentoring, right? There's downward mentoring, which a lot of us think about, where a, a dad might invest into his son or daughter, or may a, maybe a coach might invest into a, 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 a student athlete, or maybe a boss might you know, invest resources into their employee. That's what we call downward mentoring. But then there's also what? There's upward mentoring. It's where that same student might invest in, in their teacher. or Maybe an, an employee will go to their boss and say, you know what, I've got this idea. What do you think? Right? Or maybe a child says, hey, dad, can I help troubleshoot this issue that you got with my mom? Dads, I want to encourage you to evaluate yourself and ask yourself the question, are you teachable? Are you in a place, do you have the mindset that you can learn something from your, your son or your daughter? Or do you always have to have the final say? It's my way or it's the highway. To be teachable requires humility. And I want to suggest that Solomon is really telling us here that a wise dad models the virtue of being humble. Okay, so to do that is not easy. We need God's help. Would you agree? So let's pray a prayer together, okay? So if you can, just for a moment, just close your eyes just to kind of block out everything around you. Not that there's anything spiritual about having your eyes open or closed. And I want you to just pray this in your heart, whether you're a dad or whomever, but just say, Heavenly Father, please help me to be humble. Please help me to be teachable. Now for you dads, say, please help me to be the kind of dad that I can learn from my kids. And then everybody in your heart say, God, I want to be humble. Good. Virtue number two. Okay. A second virtue I want to suggest that we can see here in Proverbs chapter 7 that a wise dad will model for his son or daughter is the virtue of being respectful. Respectful. A wise dad is respectful. Look again at verse 1. Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Stop there. You know, this past week as I was pondering Solomon's advice here in these first three verses, one of the words that really captured my attention that I found myself just kind of sitting on for a long time was the word treasure. Treasure here in verse one. Church, when you survey your own life, what do you treasure? You know, what would you identify as being valuable in your life? What comes to mind? You know, this past week in the news, there's been a number of <clears throat> reports about the rain and the flooding that is taking place in Yellowstone National Park of Montana and, and uh, Wyoming. Have any of you seen it? Uh, I've, paid, I've personally paid particularly close attention to it because this summer on my motorcycle trip, I was going to spend, I'm on plan to spend a couple of days in, in Yellowstone. Um, I was able to secure some lodging, which is super hard to get. And, and there's this road in kind of the upper parts of, of, of Wyoming, kind of on the border of Montana, that, that I've wanted to ride for, for five years. I've tried to get on this road for five years, and every year something has come up. And this year was going to be the year until this morning I just got this news flash that this road that I want to ride on is washed away. And now, and it's just, it's like 11,000 feet. There's, at this point in time, there's like, third, I'm like I want to say 13 feet of snow. Like, it can snow eight feet in a night in August, in the middle of August, which is, and it's just amazing. It's this amazing road, and now I don't know if I'm going to get a ride this road. 
which is a really bummer. But because of melting snow combined with, if you've seen the, any of the reports, a surplus of historic rain, the Gardner River, which is on the north end of, of the Yellowstone National Park, it kind of surges into the Yellowstone River and it's causing this massive overflowing, causing massive amounts of destruction as the waters have surged. And for the first time in 34 years, the Yellowstone National Park is closed, right? Roads have been kind of eroded and decimated. Mudslides have, have wiped out various and numerous structures. In fact, I even watched this video report, and maybe some of you saw it, or this entire two-story home. Did you see it where it was on the edge of the kind of the river? And it just the whole thing just kind of went, tipped into the water and rushed downstream. And as I was watching, and there were people, you know, obviously it was, it, was, it was happening. I don't know how long it took, but there were people on the sidelines, you know, with their phones. You could see them kind of in the shot. But as I was watching this this house teeter on the edge and then drop into the river, this two-story home. I mean, it was a huge home and start floating, floating down, uh, you know, in the, the water surging, the flooding. The question that went into my mind was, I wonder if the owners had a chance to get any of their valuables out of this home. Now think about this. You know, I don't know how much flooding. Maybe if we have a tsunami, we might have some flooding. But for sure, fires are an issue out here. If, if there was a fire, let's just use that as an example, cave raging through Costa Mesa or Newport Beach or wherever it is that you're, you're living or those of you tuning in online, North Dakota and wherever, if you had a limited amount of time to grab your valuables, your treasures... What would you grab? How many of you, show of hands, how many of you would grab that nice big screen TV off your wall? Or how about that favorite recliner that you have? How many of you would drag that on and put that on the top of your car? Anybody? <laughs> Any pet owners in the house today? How many of you would grab your pet? Okay. What else would you grab? Maybe some pictures, right? Some family heirlooms. Right, those special, maybe important documents. Now think about this, dads, think about this. If I were to ask your kids if they felt treasured by you, what would they tell me? You know, could they tell me, could they provide me with examples of, of ways that they know that you treasure them? Or would they say that you seem to love spending the majority of your time at work or on your hobbies or out with your friends? Would your kids, would my kids say that they feel treasured? You know, when I reflect on my relationship with my dad, and I don't know if any of you can relate to this as you were growing up, but one of the dynamics of, of my relationship with my dad is that we didn't always view things from the same perspective. You know, my dad had his opinion about stuff and I had my opinion about stuff and there were times when we butted heads because of a difference of opinion. Can anybody relate to that or am I alone? Okay. Now, I know that my dad loved me. And I know that my dad would do anything for me, and he usually did. That being said, he and I didn't always agree on everything. And as I reflect on my relationship with my dad, which I tend to do a lot more now that he's no longer living. You know, he died a couple years ago. One of the things that... that I find myself reflecting on is what can I learn from my dad that I might apply in my own life with my relationship with my kids, with my daughters, you know? How, and specifically as it related to, to this week, as I was thinking about my dad and I was thinking about this word treasure, I found myself asking the question, what can I learn that I might better, how I might better illustrate to my daughters that I treasure them? Because one of the things, and one of the things I guess really that, that, that I landed on is, is, is this idea of respect. And how can I illustrate to my daughters that I respect them? 
Man, I want to suggest that a wise dad will model the virtue of being respectful. Catch this, especially in those conversations when we don't agree with each other. So dads, if you're ever in a position where you don't, aren't getting along with your son or your daughter, ask yourself and review in your mind, am I coming across in a respectful way? Especially in those conversations when we disagree. So I'm gonna close our conversation by talking about three things. I wanna offer you three really, I guess, perspectives or three components of effective communication, okay? So write these down somewhere in the margin of your notes or in your app. Let me give all three of them to you at once and then we'll unpack each of them, okay? I have learned uh, through personal experience and through lots of learning, there are really three keys to effective communication and that is this, truth, tone, and timing. Truth, tone, and timing. Okay, let's talk about truth. Solomon offers us really some advice on each of these insights. And in in Proverbs chapter 10, I'm going to go through a a bunch of verses, and Beto will have them up here on the screen for us. And if you want to write them down, I think they're probably in your app too. But Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 says that too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Okay? The NIV translation says it this way. When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Dads, I want to suggest that sometimes it is most productive during a heated conversation with a family member to speak less and listen more. There's a reason that God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? Just because you know something, just because you have truth or I have truth on our side doesn't mean that we always have to share it. To love our kids with our ears. Be respectful by listening. Seek to understand before trying to be understood. Solomon counsels that when words are flowing, the likelihood that you will say something that wounds goes up exponentially. Easy to do? No way. But with God's help, you and I can. Okay? So truth is one element of effective communication. The second element of effective communication has to do with tone. Tone. Solomon advises in Proverbs 15, verse 1, and this one I I use every week. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make a temper's flare. When I'm counseling people, or I'm in situations where tempers are flaring and the, the aggressiveness of the moment is ratcheting up I get quieter I soften my voice I open my body so it's open not like this not like this not like this very intentionally I soften my voice tone tone is so important in communication you know, psychologists, we've talked about this in the past, and a lot of you know this because you're, you're smart people, that in, in language, what makes up language, 7% of, of, our, of, our, of, of our message is only our words. 38% of our message is tone. Let me give you an example. I'm not mad. What do you believe? My words or my tone? I'm not mad. And when I use my body language, which is 55%, you don't even have to say anything. Right? You know what I'm feeling. That's why it's so hard for me because when I get upset, my eyes like turn into 
demonized. And there's no way to escape it. I can just feel my eyes going, burning through people. I'm not mad. You know? Yes, you are. You know, poke, 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 poke. Tone. Tone. Solomon counsels us that effective, respectful communication involves tone. Proverbs 25, verse 15, he says, Patience can persuade a prince, and soft speech can break bones. Dads, do you want to model being respectful? Then try to be self aware of your tone, your tone of voice. When you're in a verbal disagreement with your son or daughter, and you know, the older we get, it happens less and less, but it still happens. You know, my mom's 80, how old's my mom? 86, 87. And my, sometimes my brother will say to me, Mike, bring it down or not, you know? I'm just being honest. <laughs> yeah, look, you could be a little bit nicer in your honesty. Be self-aware of your tone when you're in a verbal disagreement. The temptation is to raise our voice, right, as men? To puff out our chest, to say, I'm the man of the house. And by the way, you might be the man of the house, but when mom walks in the room, she becomes the man of the house, right? If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's the true statement. It's not men intend to be demeaning. You know, what I say goes. Is that how your home is? It's the kind of home I grew up. Up in. My dad used to say, kids should be seen and not heard. Right. Tone. When I raise my voice, my anger intensity and the anger intensity hits the red zone. It's, I just want to suggest to you, and I'm, I'm, I'm just being transparent, it's hard to model being respectful. The appropriate response when our voice starts to get louder is actually intentionally, as I modeled earlier, to, to lower your voice. Lower your tone. Dads, the tone of our voice can either escalate or de-escalate the intensity in a disagreement. Would you, would you agree with that? So being responsible or being respectful, I think part of it involves being conscientious of the tone that we use. So there's truth, there's tone, and then the last agreement, ingredient is what I call timing. Timing. Solomon advises in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 14. He says, a loud and cheerful greeting in the morning will be taken as a curse. Right? No one likes a loud neighbor, especially early in the morning or late at night. Would you agree with that? Timing matters in how our greeting is received. And I want to suggest the same is true when having a conversation with our kids. A wise dad, a wise dad will instruct his son or daughter when they are most receptive. Are you with me? And then finally, in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 28, Solomon writes, he says, Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. With their mouths shut, they seem intelligent, right? I use that one a lot. I don't always follow it, but I think about it. You know, if my daughters don't want to hear my advice, guess what? They won't. Timing. I might have the truth on my side. I might be in a really good place where I'm using a soft dad, loving voice. But if they don't want to hear it, Can't force it on them. True tone and timing. But I've learned as you blend together these ingredients and utilize them appropriately, listen to me on this, God will help you be a dad who models how to be respectful with your kids. And I want to suggest that a child who is raised by a dad who models being humble and respectful Will be, a, will be a child who extends those same virtues to others. 
And that's the best Father's Day gift a dad could ever have. For the kids to, to extend respect and humility to others. And that, my friends, is wisdom to live by. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the book of Proverbs that is filled with bite-sized morsels of wisdom that we can apply in our life. Lord, you have given to each of us relationships, people who have invested in us and who we get the opportunity to invest in into and that's especially true for those of us who are dads those of us who have children sons and daughters Lord I want to thank you for my dad and for how he modeled generosity a trait that I now see just self-aware that God I'm generous largely because my dad was generous and I saw my grandpa model generosity and so when I think about humility and respect, which we see here, or at least I pick out in Proverbs chapter seven, I wanna model those qualities, those virtues as well. And I suspect the men and moms, all of us, Lord, we wanna extend that to the people in our lives. So help us, I pray, this week. For those who dads tuning in online, for those of us dads here today in this, in this place, help us to be men who model the virtues of humility and respect. God, increase our capacity to do that because on our own, we can't. So pour out your favor upon those here today, every one of us, Lord. Thank you for the way that you're working in our lives. And we look forward to, to today to spend time with family and friends on this Father's Day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being a dad who loves us, who is patient with us, and who is continually pouring your love into us. We receive it today when we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, 